Welcome to Lecture 2 for Chemistry 312 Radio Chemistry. This lecture is on nuclear properties and it's in two parts. The lecture on nuclear properties covers a broad topic range. The readings for this lecture can be found in Chapter 2 of Modern Nuclear Chemistry and Chapter 1 in Nuclear and Radiochemistry, the introduction, and Chapter 2 in Nuclear and Radiochemistry on Atomic Nuclei. The lecture is going to cover some interesting concepts and ideas related to nuclei that are used to understand some very fundamental properties that are the basis of what we'll explore later in the course. These include that the number of nucleons, the neutrons and protons, have an influence on the nuclear properties. We're going to see that nuclei with odd numbers of protons and odd numbers of neutrons are inherently unstable in fact, there are only four stable isotopes that have an odd number of neutrons and an odd number of protons. We're going to see that trends in masses of the nuclei are going to be used to determine information about their properties. And then we're going to explore a term called binding energy, which is the difference in the total nucleon mass and the mass of a specific nucleus. For example, you look at the helium nucleus, it has two neutrons, two protons. One would think that the mass of the helium nucleus is just the sum of two neutrons and two protons. We're going to see that that is not the case, and the implications for that difference on the nuclear properties are going to be discussed. We're also going to explore how binding energy, this difference between the mass of the total nucleons and the mass of the specific nucleus. It's going to be used to explain fission, fusion, and abundance of elements near iron. We're also going to talk about reaction energetics, the energy from nuclear reactions, and we're going to apply E equals mc squared. All we're looking at is changing of mass, and that goes into energy, or if we change energy into mass. So the energetics of nuclear reactions are actually an application of E equals mc squared. We're also going to talk about nuclear models, just a brief introduction. We're going to start with the simplest, the liquid drop model, show how this was derived, and how it led to the identification of what are called magic numbers for nuclei. And we're going to find out that nucleons fill shells similar to electrons. So as a chemist, you understand that when an electron shell gets filled, chemical properties of that element are different. And we're going to see that as nuclear shells get filled, the nuclear properties of those isotopes are also different. We're going to talk about nuclear stability from mass change. And we are also going to introduce the concept that nuclei have shape. Here's an example of a spherical nucleus. And I would think that most people would believe that that is the general shape of a nucleus. And for the most part, most nuclei are spherical. However, we're going to introduce the concept that nuclei are actually not spherical. What does that mean? And the implications for nuclear properties, nuclear stabilities, and radioactive decay are going to stem from some differences in the nuclear shape. And we'll use this baseline information throughout the course. Then we're going to end the discussion on nuclear properties, talking about nuclear quantum properties, primarily spin, parity, and magnetic moments. I'm sure you've probably overlapped and seen some of these terms already. So it's going to be a brief review talking about how these properties are derived from the nucleus and the properties of the nucleons within the nucleus. Part one of the lecture on nuclear properties is going to explore the number of nucleons and how that impacts the nucleus. There will be a discussion on nuclear masses, binding energies, and reaction energetics, with lecture one ending on discussions related to the Q value. Nuclear properties are basically derived from systematic evaluation of measured data. So, for instance, masses, how nuclear masses change, Imagine that you have an isotope and you keep adding a neutron to it. So the element is the same, the neutron number changes. 
Well, how does that mass change systematically by adding a neutron? One would think that every time I add a neutron, the mass increase would be based just upon that neutron addition. But it's actually a little bit different than that. And it has to do with the fact that the mass of the nucleus, some of that mass can be converted into energy that helps keep the nucleus together. So we'll look at masses and how those change systematically. And then we'll talk about distribution of matter. And what that really means is density within the nucleus. We'll discuss those terms and how they're derived. So fundamentally, size, shape, mass, and stability of nuclei follow patterns that can be understood. And once you have these patterns and you understand them, one develops models so that these trends can be described. So you interpret that data. That's a classic method that's been used in nuclear physics. And we'll describe how that pattern is used not only for these fundamental nuclear properties, but in methods where one evaluates decay of nuclei, trying to understand how decay occurs. So an average size and stability of a nucleus can be described by an average nucleon binding in a macroscopic model. So there'll be a macroscopic model. The first models we'll talk about were very basic. Uh, we will talk about a liquid drop model. And then detailed energy levels and decay properties can be evaluated with quantum mechanics or a microscopic model. So we're going to describe how we go from a macroscopic model to a microscopic model. And an important example of trends in the nuclei can be observed just by looking at stable nuclei and the number of neutrons and protons that are in those stable nuclei. The number of stable nuclei is known. One can evaluate the number of neutrons and the number of protons for a given stable nucleus and just do a simple characterization, say, okay, let's divide the number of stable nuclei based upon if they have an even number of neutrons and an even number of protons. And as we see here, there's this trend where there's 160 stable nuclei, so stable isotopes that have an even number of neutrons and even number of protons. There's about an equal number that have odd number of neutrons even number of protons, and then an odd number of protons, even number of neutrons. There are only four stable nuclei that have odd, odd numbers. So odd number of neutrons, odd number of protons. Chances are, if you have a isotope that has an odd number of neutrons, odd number of protons, it's not going to be stable. So this very simple property, the very first attempt at understanding some nuclear physics, count the number of neutrons, count the number of protons. So the number of protons and the neutrons are important in the nucleus. And again, if we look at any given element, there are ranges where you have a stable configuration. And if I start adding too many neutrons or taking too many neutrons away, that isotope is no longer stable. Let's start by looking at what are the four stable odd-odd nuclei. They happen to be some of the lighter stable nuclei. And if we look at the proton number of the stablest elements, well, one, three, five, seven. So hydrogen, lithium, boron, nitrogen. Chances are we're going to look at those elements and they're going to have a stable isotope with an odd-odd number of neutrons and protons. So hydrogen one proton, one neutron, hydrogen two, deuterium, it's stable, low percentage. If we go to lithium, we see that lithium six as shown here, three protons, three neutrons, stable. Boron 10, five protons, five neutrons, and then nitrogen 14. The next odd numbered Z, so odd number of protons for an element is fluorine. And if you look at fluorine, there is no stable isotope of fluorine with an odd number of neutrons. So these four isotopes here are the only four stable isotopes that have an odd number of neutrons and an odd number of protons. From the first introduction of this lecture, we said that mass is going to be an important consideration in determining nuclear properties. So look at it this way. We can evaluate the mass of a given isotope. And what's the difference between the actual mass of the nucleus and the expected mass from the atomic number? 
So for instance, if we define carbon 12 as 12 AMU, that's the definition, we can talk about something called a mass excess. If the mass excess is negative, then the isotope has more binding energy than carbon 12. And the mass excess, we're going to, it's a term that we're going to introduce. It's this delta term, and it's equal to the nuclear mass minus A is the mass number. So we can get a value, this unit's in MeV. So we take a mass unit and we're converting it into MeV, which is an energy unit, so mega electron volt. So we're going to talk about this mass excess in terms of MeV. And the reason we're doing that is the numbers were one, easier to handle, but two, they're useful for determining energetics since we're just taking the change in masses and already converting that to energy. And how do we do that? Well, we use E equals MC squared. So this is what's interesting or a nice aspect of this work with radioactive decay. We get a relationship between energy and mass and it's the Einstein equation. As an example of what we mean by a mass excess, if we look at sodium 24, the AMU, the atomic mass is listed here. It's just a little bit under 24, right? So 23.9909, et cetera, minus 24 is equal to this very small negative number. And I already gave you this value that we're gonna convert it from atomic mass units into energy. And it turns out that one atomic mass unit is equal to 931.5 MeV. So about one atomic mass unit is about 1,000 MeV, kind of a reasonable rule of thumb. So if I take this value, multiply it by 931.5 MeV per atomic mass unit, I get that the mass excess for sodium 24 is equal to negative 8.418, et cetera, MeV, mega electron volts. So this is a value that we could use for equations, and it's a way of quantifying how changes in this atomic mass unit can be used to help us understand reactions. So right now, all we've done is defined this uh, mass excess term, which is the atomic mass unit minus the A of that isotope. We get a value, and we multiply it by 931.5, and we get this mass excess. You won't have to do this. There's actually large tables with this mass excess data. Remember, it's the delta. The table of the isotopes, for instance, what we talked about in lecture one, has all the mass excess for all the isotopes listed. And this is all derived from E equals MC squared. In the previous slide, we focused on nuclear masses, but since we're talking about atoms, we really need to consider the atomic mass, and let's convince ourselves that basically the electron mass doesn't matter in the atom. So we can talk about the nuclear mass as found from the atomic mass. So the nuclear mass is equal to the atomic mass minus the mass of the electrons plus the binding energy of those electrons. Now the electron rest mass is about half an MeV, we know that atomic mass unit is about 1,000 MeV, so the 0.511 MeV electron mass divided by 931.5 MeV is a pretty small number, 5.5 times 10 to the negative 4 atomic mass units. So the fraction of the mass that the electron has compared to a one nucleon is pretty small. So in that regards, eliminating the electron mass from this equation makes sense. The total binding energy of all electrons can be given as this equation where the binding energy is equal to 15 z to the 7 thirds where z is the number of protons in EV. As an example with uranium a z of 92 the binding energy is half an MeV for the electrons in uranium. So a small number. These masses are an MeV Again, this number is also pretty insignificant. So both the binding energy term and the electron mass term can be neglected. So that allows us just to focus on the nuclear masses in any decay from parent to progeny. So our concept with 
the using the nuclear masses is relevant. We can look at the beta decay and determine the Q value for this route. Using the mass excesses, beta decay, we have an isotope that converts an excess neutron to a proton, gives off an electron, an antineutrino, and some energy. So let's consider the beta particle, the electron, to be part of this charged new atom that's made. Since we're converting a neutron into a proton, Z goes to Z plus one, the charge goes up. Well, let's just consider this electron as part of this. Okay, we're neglecting the binding energy, but that's okay. We know that that's not something that we really need to be concerned about. So the Q value is equal to the mass excess of the parent minus the mass excess of the progeny. An example of this, calculate the Q value for the beta decay of carbon-14. Carbon-14 decays to nitrogen-14 and a beta particle plus an antineutrino plus Q. Rearrange the equation, solve for Q. So Q is equal to the carbon-14 mass excess minus the nitrogen-14 mass excess. We can look up mass excess values from this site and we plug in those mass excess values and we get 3.0198 minus 2.8634 is equal to 0 0.156 MeV. These values are in MeV. So now we have a route for calculating energies for decays. And we've shown that we can calculate the Q value for the beta decay of carbon-14. On the previous slide, we saw that the Q value for the decay of carbon-14 is 0 0.156 MeV. I also told you that you could get the mass excess data for the isotopes involved, so carbon-14, nitrogen-14, from the nuclear wallet cards and the website for the nuclear wallet cards listed here. So I'll show you what that would look like if you were to go to this website and click on it. You would find a periodic table that would pull up find carbon and nitrogen as they are shown here click on them in series so you would select carbon get the data select nitrogen then get your data and what this would look like is shown here this is z of six so that's carbon the data mass excess and mev value shown here The nitrogen data, Z of 7, nitrogen 14, shown here. So again, the Q value would be the parent 3.01989 minus the daughter 2.86341. And that's how one can calculate the Q value for that specific reaction. Using the same methodology, one can evaluate the Q value for a positron decay. And again, for the positron decay, it's neutron deficient. So a proton is converted into a neutron. So you have an isotope that decays. It goes from an isotope with a given Z to an isotope with a Z minus one. A positron comes out, which is basically an antimatter electron, a neutrino, and then the Q value. So let's consider the Q value. Now, fundamentally, we have two extra electrons to consider. I have this atom that decays. I've taken a proton and converted it to a neutron. So this atom has an excess electron. This positron that comes out, we'll also treat that as an electron. So we have two extra electrons to consider. Positron and additional electron from the daughter. The mass of each electron is 0.511 MeV. So we need to add this, we need to consider this term 1.022 MeV total from the electrons. So we look at a Q value is equal to the parent mass minus the sum of the progeny mass and 1.022 MeV, the 1.022 MeV accounting for the electron and positron. Let's consider the positron decay of niobium-90 to zirconium-90. A positron is emitted. 
We look up the mass excesses for niobium-90, zirconium-90. The positron and electron mass is listed here as 1.022 MeV. And we get this value of 5.089 MeV. We can do the same calculation for electron capture. In this case, the electron comes from the parent orbital. Parent can be designated as a cation to represent this behavior. So we have a parent here that takes an electron, then a proton is converted into a neutron. A neutrino is emitted. So from this, the Q value is just equal to, well, this gets neutralized, so we don't have to worry about electron mass. So it's just the mass of the parent minus the progeny mass. So let's look at the electron capture of bismuth 207 to lead 207. Again, that's moving down the periodic table. We can negate and ignore the neutrino. The Q value is listed here. So we just need to get the mass excess for these isotopes. We obtain the mass excess for these isotopes. We run the equation and we get that electron capture of Bismuth 207 is 2.3947 MeV. We can do the Q value calculation for alpha decay, and this is shown here, where I have an isotope, it decays, it emits a helium nucleus, which is shown here. The progeny loses two neutrons, two protons, so the A is reduced by four the proton number is reduced by two. So let's consider the alpha decay of americium-241. It decays to neptunium-237. And the alpha particle. So the Q value is equal to the mass of the parent minus the sum of the progeny mass and the alpha particle mass. So we can use mass excess uh, to determine this. We can also do this with something called the Q-value calculator, and I'll show you how to use that later in this lecture. But let's consider the terms that we have here. One needs to get the mass excess of americium-241, neptunium-237, and helium-4, the alpha particle. The mass excess of americium-241 is provided here. The mass excess of neptunium 237 is listed here, and the mass excess for the helium-4 nucleus, which is the alpha particle, is listed here. And I pulled this out of compendium of information and data that's in the back of the, the textbook, Nuclear and Radiochemistry. So we get this Q value. And then if I look at the alpha decay energies for americium-241, I actually find that the Q values are over the alpha decay energies. And that's to be expected because the Q value is the total reaction. When we discuss alpha decay, we'll go into this in a little bit more detail. But the Q value is the alpha decay energy plus the progeny recoil. Therefore, the actual alpha decay energies will be close to the Q value, but slightly under that value. We will calculate the relationship later this lecture. Now the data that I showed you is available, uh, the mass excess data, and if I know the mass excess data, I can actually calculate Q values for a number of different reactions. Uh, one area where you can find this information, as I already mentioned, on the, the table of the isotopes, you can get some of the Q value reactions. But there's also something that you can get on your phone, the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, isotope browser. Information on the isotope browser is available here from this web page, but you can download it from um, your Android or Apple-based uh, applications. The IAEA isotope browser, it will include Q values, but also include information on energy of the decays, half-lives, decay modes, percentages, and other information that'll be useful for the course. So um, I, I use the IAEA isotope browser all the time, um, and it's certainly a resource that you can use. So if you wanted to do Q-value calculations of specific reactions, 
you don't necessarily have to go through and use the mass excesses as uh, we just described. Um, mainly that information was presented so you understand where the data comes from. A lot of this compendium is already available. If you had the isotope browser, first thing you'd want to do is select the isotope you're interested in. So here is carbon-14 listed. You would then select go, and that would bring you to this page. Here'd be the information, carbon-14, the half-life, the spin and parity, and the decay mode, followed by the percentage or any sort of branching ratios. You would select this, and it would bring you over to the next page where it would have the information on carbon-14, would give you the references, gives you the, the number of protons, neutrons, spin and parity, the half-life, the parents, the decays, and it gives you these Q values. So you can calculate the Q alpha, the Q beta, the Q electron capture. These are neutron and proton separation energies. There's binding energies, masses, cross-section information. Uh, by click by moving around and exploring, you can find a lot of different information. So for instance, we know that carbon-14 decays by beta, and it has the energy in KeV of that beta, along with the percentage, and then decay energy information. So there's lots of information on these isotopes. So for here, one of the first questions we asked, what's the Q value for the beta decay of carbon-14? You could use the isotope browser and got 156.476 keV. Now we showed the Q value for specific reactions. Actually, you can determine the Q value of any reaction. So just treat the Q, the energy, as part of the equation and solve for Q. So example, imagine this reaction where we take some iron and we have a target of iron and we hit it with helium-4 and cobalt-59 is made along with a proton. What's the energetics of that reaction? Well, we can write the Q value. It's the mass of the products minus the mass of the reactants. We have the mass. C squared makes it into energy. Um, the Q value calculator, which we'll talk about, I can enter this information and out comes a value. I can get the mass excess and Q value data that are necessary from a number of different sources, this table of the isotopes, Q value calculator, and then atomic masses of isotopes. This Q value calculator is a tool from the uh, National Nuclear Data Center at Brookhaven National Laboratory that you can input the reaction information and the Q value will come out. Q values can also be calculated using websites. One does a search for Q value calculator, two sites will show up. One will be from Brookhaven National Laboratory, another from Russia. Let's look at both these, but focus in on the one from Brookhaven National Laboratory. So this Q value calculator, the data that it uses, the mass evaluation data is shown here. So in our previous slides, we went over how to do the calculations from the mass excesses. This website uses the mass excesses found here. And you can read some of the disclaimers on this site. And for instance, NN or N, uh, lowercase or uppercase NN is listed as a neutron. So there's a few things this site can do. First, we'll start with the summary. And if we just put in an isotope, let's start with bismuth-212 and say submit. It'll give me all the information about the decays of bismuth-212 and some of the nuclear data. So here's the isotope bismuth-212. It'll have the mass excess, the binding energy per atomic mass, the atomic mass units, the neutron mass, the Q value for beta minus, number of different decays, electron capture, positron, neutron, proton. As you can see here, there's many different types of reactions that can occur. Decays that are calculated doesn't mean that they all will be seen, but any reaction that's positive does have a possibility, thermodynamically speaking, of occurring. And for bismuth-212, I want to note that beta minus has a positive Q value. And again, 
these Q values are in KEV. They're not explicitly listed, but these values are in KEV. And the alpha also has a positive Q value. This isotope does, in fact, branch. It decays about 33% by alpha and the remainder by beta minus. So if, as opposed to getting all this decay data, if one wanted to just get a specific decay, we can put in the isotope, the decay mode, and let's just say alpha and submit. And the Q value for the bismuth 212 alpha decay to thallium 208 is shown here. And this is the Q value and KEV is listed. We could also say, well, what if we just wanted to know what would, uh, if I have bismuth 212, what would have to decay in order to make a certain isotope? So let's say if I wanted to make lead 208. Well, bismuth 212 to make lead 208 would need a uh, hydrogen 4 emission, very unlikely, but it will give you the Q value here. Or if I said, what if um, deuterium is emitted? So bismuth 212 plus deuterium yields lead 210. Now, this Q value not only can be used for, this Q value website can not only be used for the decays, but also for nuclear reactions. As we discussed in a previous slide, we're showing reactions with iron. But let's take a classic, nucle classic reaction. Let's take lead, 208. And let's turn it into gold. And let's start off by just hitting it with a proton. And let's say I want to make 197A gold. That's the stable isotope of gold. All right, so lead plus a proton, beryllium-12, and gold-197 could be products. The Q value is listed here. And the threshold energy, which we'll describe later in the course, is listed here. Now, let's say if I did this reaction at a certain energy, what I also want to show is that this reaction, when you discuss a nuclear reaction, often many, many different types of reactions occur. So let's say we're, we'll use lead to, to await as a target, our proton as a projectile, and we'll use 20 MeV as the proton energy on target. This is, and these are all the different types of reactions that can occur. And as you see, there are many, many types of reactions. Here's gold 201 that's made with two alphas coming out, thallium 205 with an alpha, as you can, here's just bismuth 209 emitting a gamma, so it just absorbs that proton. And as you can see, for a given nuclear reaction, there's lots of different probabilities uh, and different reaction mechanisms that can occur. These probabilities for each reaction is described by a cross-section, and we'll describe that later in the course. So you see from this Q-value calculator site, you can get lots of information for a summary of an isotope, a specific decay, or any reaction you can possibly think of. The site from Russia is similar. It has a database. You can discuss decays. So we can start with our bismuth decay. Bismuth 212, let's just make it go to an alpha particle, thallium 208, and we get the Q value. We can do a reaction, lead 206 plus deuterium, let's make gold, and beryllium 11, and here's the Q value. This site, we could do three fragments or four fragments. We can also do a fusion reaction. So both these sites can be used during the course. The means of doing the calculations were previously discussed. But for any time a question is related to Q values, please feel free to use this material, either of these sites, 
during the course. So let's review what we've gone over about Q-value calculations. So Q-value for the beta decay of sodium-24. Sodium-24 decaying into magnesium-24. Beta particle, antineutrino, Q-value. Set up. Let's solve for the Q-value. Remember, for beta minus decay, we can combine the progeny and the electron together, so we don't need to break out the electron mass separately for the Q-value calculation for beta decay. So the Q-value is just sodium-24 minus manganese-24. We get this from the atomic mass units, 931.5 MeV per atomic mass unit. This is our Q value. If we go from the mass excess values, we can pull up the information from here. We can calculate the mass excess. We get pretty good agreement. Electron capture of sodium-22. Sodium-22 is capturing its own electron. So let's make it all one atom. Neon-22, neutrino Q value. Again, from the mass values, we get the difference in the AMU, 931.5. MeV per AMU. From the mass excesses, we can pull the mass excesses out of here. So sodium 22 and neon 22. The difference in the mass excesses is 2.843 MeV. And as you can see, it is in very good agreement with the Q value calculated directly from the masses of sodium 22 and neon 22. There's a term we've already introduced, binding energy, that comes from these energetic terms. Binding energy is the difference between the constituent nucleons and the mass of the nucleus. So if I think of a nucleus, it has so many neutrons, so many protons, I can determine the mass of that nucleus, I know the mass of neutrons and protons, and I can compare the two. And fundamentally, there is a difference in those masses, and that can be thought of in terms of energy released if all the nucleons were used to form the nucleus. The nuclear mass is not equal to the sum of the constituent nucleons. So we can talk about an energy that goes from the number of protons and the number of neutrons in a nucleus minus the mass of the nucleus. That mass must have gone somewhere, goes into the energy that keeps the nucleus together. So we'll call it binding energy. And we actually describe binding energy per nucleon. Because if I have a larger nucleus, if I have more of these nucleons interacting, the binding energy will be greater just because there's more nucleons. So we actually want this average binding energy. So we can calculate a total binding energy equal to the mass of the protons plus the mass of the neutrons minus the mass of the nucleus, and then multiply it by c squared to get energy. And then I divide that by the total number of nucleons in the nucleus, and I get an average binding energy or a binding energy per nucleon. So some it describes how some of this mass is converted into energy that keeps the nucleus stable. So one of the trends that's observed is that the binding energy of an even A nucleus is generally higher than the adjacent odd A nuclei. And if we th think about this, even even nuclei dominate and they tend to have the most stable configurations. Another trend that's borne out from this binding energy curve, as we see here, is that I can fuse atoms together and create energy. This is where the concept of fusion comes from, and it's effectively used in stellar processes. So stars run off of fusion. We know that we could take lighter atoms, create helium. Helium is shown right at that peak right there. But what this curve shows is that you can actually get energy by fusing elements all the way up to iron. This is, in fact, what stars do. One of the other things uh, that this binding energy curve shows is fission. I can take heavy elements, split them in two, and they create elements with larger binding energies. This is a driving force for nuclear fission. We also see that energy release from fission creates these lighter isotopes, there's this maximum stability around iron. 
this stability is actually responsible for the observed abnormally high abundances of the iron groups and the elements right around iron. And elements up to iron can be formed in stellar fusion. So you get stars gaining energy by fusing these elements together. And we will talk about the stellar processes for making elements later in this course. So these relatively straightforward calculations can actually be used to help explain phenomenon that we observe in nuclear reactions. So for example, uranium-235 can fission, can split in two, can create energy when a thermal neutron, a very, very low energy neutron, interacts with it. But uranium-238 doesn't. Let's explore, just from the energetics, what may drive this. So we have a general reaction. We've got some isotope. It absorbs a neutron. It makes the same element, one isotope up, plus energy. So let's look at the reaction of a neutron with uranium-235 and uranium-238. Calculate the Q value. So the Q value for uranium-235 would be uranium-235 plus a neutron going to uranium-236. And for uranium-238 would be uranium-238 plus a neutron going to uranium-239. We can determine the mass excess values here. Here's the neutron. Here's uranium-235, uranium-236, uranium-238, uranium-239. We get that the Q value for the uranium-238 reaction is about 4.8 MeV, and the Q value for uranium-235 is about 6.5 MeV. It turns out that fission requires somewhere between 5 and 6 MeV to overcome this fission barrier. Does uranium-233 fission from a thermal neutron? We can run that calculation. Yes, it does. And this property is actually due to the fact that when that neutron comes in, you get neutron pairing that helps drive the energetics. So we were able to describe this interesting nuclear phenomenon where we get fission of uranium-235 by thermal neutrons, but not uranium-238 based on these energetic equations. This concludes part one of lecture two for chemistry 312 radiochemistry. When you've completed part one, please continue to part two.